Thank you for coming tonight. I'm Frederick Glacier. I'm uh, author of an epic poem, The Parliament of Poets, set partly on the moon and around the world, uh, various uh, countries and cultures. Since 2014, I've read it Crazy Wisdom five times for the poetry, storytelling, and shaman groups. And since my epic is over 9,000 lines, I thought I'd uh, invite people here tonight to uh, have a taste of it longer than five or 10 minutes. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, give it a sense of the story as a shaman tale and journey drawing from and evoking all the great spiritual and wisdom traditions in regional civilizations. If modernity meant evolving away from the old forms of exclusivism into the exclusivism of the Enlightenment outlook, from the moon together, we can now see universality. If, as, as a global tale, over 30 years in the making, I'm speaking to the entire planet, not merely the Western world. While, while the whole is always more than the sum of its parts, I gratefully acknowledge my indebtedness to such writers and thinkers as a historian Arnold Poinby, Carl Jung, Houston Smith, Aldous Huxley, Joseph Campbell, and many others of a more open and universal sensibility. Campbell especially uh, wrote on shamanism and myth and their power to heal the tribe through a visionary experience and tale. Campbell uh, also wrote repeatedly about the overview image of the moon, uh, of the earth rising above the moon, uh, taken fortuitously by the astronauts, really, uh, while they were uh, up for rocks and other things. And uh, as the great new mythic image and symbol of our time, he argued. I hope that my epic tale might be judged worthy of uh, the best in their, their writing and thinking. Apollo calls all the poets of the nations, ancient and modern, east and west, to the moon, Consult on the meaning of modernity. The Parliament of Poets chooses one of its own and sends them on a journey to the seven continents to learn from all of the spiritual and wisdom traditions of humankind. On Earth and on the Moon, the poets teach a new global universal vision of life. The book has 12 chapters, each with three to five cantos, uh, for more than a total of uh, uh, 40, 40 cantos. I'm going to read a selection of only four can cantos from four cantos tonight. To su suggest the scope of the book, it is set partly on the moon and in Australia, India, Cambodia, Burma, Myanmar, Tibet, China, Japan, Africa, France, England, Russia, the Middle East, Central and South America, and elsewhere. First, a selection from the very beginning of Book One, Chapter One, set on the moon, already at the Apollo 11 landing site, followed by selections from elsewhere in the book. Book one, on the moon, the main character, the poet of the moon speaking. In the mid part of the moon I stood, in the midst of the sea of tranquility, looking around me from rim to curving rim, the brilliant moonscape against the blackest black of space, stark blackness, polarities of light and night, where a human footstep marked a giant leap forward in lunar dust for all mankind. Footsteps still all about, undisturbed, untouched by decades of time, destined to remain for all time, 
eternity or as near to it as we can imagine, unlike what Robinson Crusoe found, an ephemeral footprint on, the, on a beach. Here with instruments and a flag unfurled in the solar wind, half a lunar module, the descent platform left far behind the glory of the moon and all creation. And then I saw him sitting upon his nag, Rosinante, Don Quixote, a lance resting across his saddle as he leaned forward from next to a crater, gazing my way. At first, shock overwhelmed me, finding myself where I was, disoriented, disbelieving. How could it be? I stood there without an encumbering spacesuit, lightly clad in my old corduroy jacket, worn beyond its prime, breathing in the atmosphere of the moon. The man of La Mancha plodded slowly on his nag, even as I began to realize we were not alone. A crowd of people were coming toward me, too. How could they have gotten here as well, I wondered. My own presence in Cervantes still a mystery, unexplained, beyond belief, amazement, deeply stirring, shaking my very being as I recall my flight to the moon. A creaking leather saddle woke me further to his nearness as he leaned closer to me, looking annoyed, eyeing me from his mount. So you finally made it up here. What's taking you so long? Out. Don't give yeah. any of your excuses. Yeah. We've all been waiting for you. Here the they great pride went Snap up. Drums, tom, tom, the deep bass sound, the tightly stretched hide, chanting of many braves, pounding of hearts. Clearing a space, poets made room for a young Lakota Indian brave, strong and virile, raising a hoop before him, dancing the hoop, dance of his people, the hoop dance of all the peoples of Mother Earth, far above while all stood round, the poets and seers, shamans and singers, rios and troubadours, bards and rapsos watching him pounding moon dust mesmerized for he danced in another world, the world as it were of the moon. Behind him all could see the hoop of the earth, the beyond the hoop of the hoop of the moon, within the hoop of the moon's own hoop, the hoop of our rotating solar system, the hoop of the spiraling Milky Way, the hoops of the innumerable, innumerable galaxies, the hoop of the endless universe. His long braids spun with the planets spinning on their axes as he weaved in and out and through nine hoops and the pounding of the drums pulsed through the arteries of the universe. First one way and then the other, his moccasins dancing through moon dust, feathers proudly worn, hide loincloth, pipe bone breastplate, and headdress transfixing everyone by the energy of his dance. Seen by all, an even more astounding sight took place as he slowly changed into an ancient medicine man standing proud and noble, holding a sacred coop stick, a medicine wheel, with seven feathers suspended from it. The youth was gone. Black Elk stood before us. Behold the earth, he commanded, gesturing with his coop stick, directing our gaze, rising like a hoop of many peoples. It is wholly being endless, broken like a ring of smoke. The broken hoop begins to heal to encircle the Indian nation. All nations once again heal. All the universe seemed to listen. In a sacred manner, wide as starlight, though broken and scattered, Black Elk moved toward me, lifting his croup stick to earth. The holy tree will heal and flourish. Poets and shamans bring the people back into the sacred hoop that they might walk again the red road in a sacred manner, pleasing to Wakantakan, the great mystery, Gichi Minato, the great spirit, the great father beyond all the names of my people, the spirit of the universe. 
looking out over the sea of tranquility at the sea of faces following his every word, Black Elk said, Though nations are in despair, teach this poet your strong medicine that he might help mankind walk the good road again. Coming down from the module, I stood before Black Elk, struggling with emotion, speechless, overcome by the vision of his words. Black Elk began chanting, raising the hoop, raising the vision of man, not white, not red, but human before the universe, the good earth spinning in the background. And then he said, it is hard to follow the great vision in the world of darkness. Many men get lost among the shadows. Turning round to all the assembled poets on all sides, Black Elk said, we must be the pathfinders for this poet, guide him through the forest of memory on the right path. Even I despaired for my people, thought the people's beautiful dream had died. I, to whom was given so great a vision, sometimes dreams are wiser than waking. We know the center is not dead, cannot die. The great mystery watches all his children. Help this poet tend the sacred dream. One of the women, born again at the center of the sweet the medicine is strong, strong level or slick, drawing two men in the sand. I felt that something of great importance was about to be told. All stayed silent. In the beginning, Jindu, the creator, sent two wise men to shake the earth from the far end of the Milky Way, which she drew in the sand above the men. They shaped the sea, the earth, and the sky. And then Jindu sent seven sisters, stars of the Milky Way, Pleiades, to beautify the earth with flowers and trees. Birds and animals, every creeping thing, drawing the seven sisters near the men. Younger men and women now join the outside of our circle. Then Barda continued without any sense of, her, of interruption. While they worked, one of the young sisters fell in love with the two wise men, following them into the bush one day. Dharama, the great spirit, had warned them that if such a thing happened, they could not return to the Milky Way. So while the one woman had to stay, the others rose to the stars, and the two spirit men remained behind and became human like us. Losing their special powers, feeling longing for their home. They became the parents of the earth, made laws and Whoa, ceremonies. Woe to a time the parents, yes, yes, the measure of man. The desert people, for then all people our fall man. to the darkest depths, and not even I could defend myself against attackers with all my herbs and potions. Even porcupine quills could not drive away such men, reduced to rapacious beasts. Her voice broke, pure tears falling from her eyes as she turned toward the village, pausing briefly in anguish, seeking the path forward. Quietly I stood, uncomprehending still, but deeply moved by the poignancy of her plaintive song and heartfelt grief, sensing some tragedy lay before us. Wiping her eyes, she set out through the bush. I followed with a word, not knowing what to say, until we again broke through jungle into a wide clearing that at the far end held the village compounds of round thatch huts of mud brick set on a rise of the land. And there she started to talk about the woe, about the coming of soldiers, warring tribes, Hutus and Tutsis, Rwandans, Ugandans, Congolese, and many factions. The loss of human love, all carried cast to the winds. 
And as she spoke, she began to change before my eyes from an older woman of traditional dress to a modern woman of equally striking composure and beauty, an elegant African beauty dressed in the finest international fashion from Paris, Italy, Tokyo, or New York. Her lipstick and makeup and stylish hair revealing a beautiful young woman excoriating a man of her time who forgot the human spirit without king or chief or guiding elders, hate and green ruling in their place, sought power and control, minerals and oil, diamonds, copper and metals, things of the world, not the soul. Millions slaughtered black Africans again enslaving Africans raped into submission before their fathers, husbands, children, as in a nightmare, the nightmare of life in this world run amok. Shaking her head, she gave me the calabash, saying, Africa is more than a calabash. Then stepping apart, she leaned back her head, a black jewel as black as a blackest black of space, a universal jewel of great price, a living universe of womanhood. In her deepest mystery, feminine jewel, a cipher all men seek to solve of every hue. A daughter of Sogolan, as she were, namesake, a daughter, saying, I, Sogolan, see a vast refugee camp spanning this valley through the country, the continent, the world, out of the heart heart of humanity, standing by, watching, moved and unmoved, all complicitous, all lacking the will to stop the brutalization of women, vulnerable, weak, frail. Why do you all stand by and watch on TV? Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere on earth. The loss has first taken place in the human heart. For the heart of darkness exists everywhere, not only Africa by any means. Everywhere women are brutalized in rape. Man become an animal, an old and terrible sight. Every manner of violence and bloodshed unleashed or perpetrated by the human race, concealed behind the tribal dress, the military uniform, three-piece suit, sucking the bones in the marrow. Here is what is in man that destroys women. Here is what destroys man, making him a beast, worse than a beast, a sick and evil thing. Oh, Africa, oh, humanity, I sing the deepest grief for the young, the innocent, the gentle children done unto death with machetes and pango blades, shot and bombed, burned in their homes and villages for the insane ideas of their parents and the world. And then a young African man appeared by her side, quietly listening, her equal dressed in a suit, a cell phone in his hand, slipping it inside his coat. Glancing at him, she began to sing, Heal, O Africa, I, Sogolan, a daughter of Sunyata's mother, a modern woman, a mother who has suckled at her breast. Cry out, heal with all the power of my spirit. Heal, embrace the healing medicine, potions and herbs, amulets, before the judging presence of the past. Bend down in shame and repentance. Hear the voices of guiding elders, grandmothers and mothers, daughters and sisters, wives and babies, hear the fathers of village traditions, hear their one voice, rise up, struggle, strive to remain human, to be worthy of more than a rapacious beast, worse even than jungle animals, cease murdering, torturing, raping, pillaging, and the plundering of all decency from Mother Earth, for even she, you have not restrained yourselves from brutally raping. 
with the help of foreign corporations. Even now, your victims lie prostrate, gasping for what may be their last breath. Awake from the distracted nightmare of your madness. Awake before it is too late. So long ended her song. I stood mute, dumbfounded, overwhelmed by her appeal. No man exempt from her scathing condemnation human evil.